So I filled in and I did this uh, convention. And the next Star Trek event where I sat and, and uh, spoke was uh, happening right now. Really? Is it, wow. the, this is the only other time you've really sat down at what you might call a, and that's incredible. That's awesome. Gonna go and do my convention thing. Got my costume, I'm going now. Yeah, we're having a ball. It's Star Trek, y'all. Hey, man, the Lord, be me up. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a very special episode of Shuttle Pod. We'll be answering some more of your fan questions and a lot more. And now for our hosts, Connor Trenier and Dominic Keating. Hi, Hi Erica. Erica. Hi, guys. How are you? Lovely. I love to be outside. Right. So it's a uh, lovely day. Bit digging this. What happened to Wash? Where's he gone? Well, Wash is on vacation, uh, which uh, works out for us. Are because we paying for that? We have all his family here. You do. <laughs> <laughs> We're not paying for that. No <laughs> worries. <laughs> Wash is using his bonus. Yes. <laughs> Well, hi everyone. Welcome back to the Shuttle Pod. We are absolutely thrilled, super excited, um, humbled even uh, to be here at our, our, <laughs> our old boss's house. Um, the head man himself, the uh, the wizard behind the curtain, the man blowing the smoke, pulling the strings, and telling people where to put the mirrors. Uh, a chap that Sir Patrick Stewart has on speed dial and calls a bloody good mate, <laughs> Mr. Rick Berman. It's an honor. What an honor to be here, sir. It's my honor. It is my honor. Thanks for hosting us you at your beautiful home, too. This Thank is you really so a much. treat. Uh, it's been 20 years, Rick. God bless, mate. You look great. Well, with that said, I mean, uh, I remember years ago when you cast me and we were... I once asked you, you know, how did you get started in Star Trek? And you said, we'll have a lunch at the commissary. And you know how Hollywood is. We didn't have lunch at the commissary, sadly. Uh, we did other things, but we, I never got that story from the horse's mouth. Do you want to go back all those years and tell us how you uh, met Roddenberry and got associated with this incredible franchise and, 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 and well, ran? I, I, I'd, be, I'd be happy to. I, uh, I want to start off by saying that I'm in the process now of every day going through the punishment of working on a memoir. Mm. So I don't want to give too all, much of the farm I, I don't want to give all yeah. of it. No, agree. All of it uh, here, but I, I certainly can. You heard it first here, by the way, people. There's a book coming. I was uh, a documentary filmmaker in New York City. Right. Uh, and I worked there until about 1984. At that point, I was married. I had a two-year-old son, and things were sort of drying up. So we decided, let's let's go to L.A. and see what happens. Right. And we came to L.A., and I managed, very luckily, to, I first got a job at Warner Brothers, and then I got in, in kind of the executive television branch. And then that sort of collapsed. The whole area that I was in was sort of shut down, and I, uh, uh, I ended up... It, at Paramount. And at Paramount, I was director of current programming uh, for Paramount Television, which was kind of a riot. I was, uh, I had never really been involved in, in, in dramatic television before. Uh, to some degree I had, but uh, I, uh, I suddenly found my boss, a fellow by the name of John Pike, who was the president of network television, telling me that shows like uh, Family Ties, Cheers, Webster, MacGyver, uh, Call to Glory, basically, you're in charge of these shows. And it's like, there were times where he would say to me, go to the Charles Brothers. They were the guys who mm -hmm. were writing uh, Cheers, yeah. probably the two top comedy writers in Hollywood. And he would say, go to them and tell them you don't like Act Two. How old are you at this point? Are you yeah, in your I'm, 20s? I was like Sorry. seven years old. I had, I had no experience doing this kind of stuff. So I would go down and I would say, Act 2 is just really terrific. <laughs> and then run out the door. <laughs> Act 2 is terrific. So at one point, it, t time went on. About a year later, I was uh, promoted to vice president of this and that uh, in the executive branch. you got to remember, this is a year and a half of being an executive, which I had never been before. Right. Uh, 
In dramatic and stuff that you, you know, you're a documentarian. So exactly. New ground, yeah. So it was announced that Gene Roddenberry wanted to do uh, another Star Trek series. They'd been They'd done a couple of they, movies by they this had point. Dug, they had done uh, either two or three movies at this right. point. Uh, but the show had been off the air for seven years, the original series. Right. And they kept bugging him to do another one, and he said no, and finally he agreed to say yes. So, he, so they had to sort of you know, twist his arm to, yeah. to come up with something. He, right? he wasn't interested. He was a, 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 an odd duck, a wonderful man, but uh, he was very firm in his, his interests and his mm-hmm. desires and his beliefs. Right. So uh, he worked on a script with a woman named Dorothy Fontana, I believe, and the two of them wrote a one-hour script. The studio wanted it to be a two-hour pilot. And they decided to have a meeting in Gene's office. And they wanted to put somebody in charge of this new series. And I was the lowest man on the totem pole, (laughs) by far, (laughs) because Roddenberry had a reputation of being a real pain in the ass, Mm -hmm. of being kind of tough and and, uh, not fun to work with. So I attended this meeting with all the bigwigs from Paramount to try to talk Gene and his lawyer, Leonard Maislish, who was also his best friend and uh, his confidant, uh, to make a a two-hour pilot as opposed to a one-hour pilot. And Gene would have nothing... Nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. And then at one point... One of the studio executives who was above me, they they were all above me, Mm -hmm. uh, said something and I rolled my eyes because it was so ridiculous what he said. And uh, Leonard, Gene's lawyer, saw this eye roll and he thought it was kind of (laughs) cool. So when the meeting was over... Are you saying this all happened for an eye roll? How about that? <laughs> yeah. in, in a sense, it did. Well, when, I know that. When the meeting was over, uh, the studio won. They agreed on a two-hour pilot. Right. So the whole Q story was put into it. Uh, right. There was no Q in the original oh. script. And then I got a call from Mazelish saying, uh, you want to come over uh, and have lunch with me in the commissary. And I said, sure. And we talked for a long time. And he said, you know, Gene might be interested in somebody who's not connected with the old Star Trek. Because everybody who was involved at that point in this new project had been somehow Bob Justman, who was like my mentor, and Eddie Milkus, and Dorothy Fontana, and David Gerald. All these people had worked on the original series. He thought Gene might like somebody who had not been involved some in fresh eyes. Series. Some fresh eyes, some younger eyes, because mm-hmm. all these guys were well into their 60s. And also, in my case, somebody who had never really seen Star Trek and didn't know much about it. So It the, wasn't in your wheelhouse. No. I think I had seen one movie. Maybe you never not. watched the original show back in the day? No, were, I was in. I, I think I was in college, and I were, just, yeah, I just sort of, there wasn't much yeah. in television. The next day, I was asked to have lunch with Gene, who was a pretty big man on campus. He, when he walked around, he was right. a big, big man. When he walked around uh, Paramount, people would kind of go, "That's Gene right. Right. So we sat down in the commissary and we talked, and it turned out that he had been an airline pilot, and he had been an Air Force pilot, or an Army. Air Corps pilot during World War II. And uh, I I told him about all of my travels because I worked for the United Nations. I worked for the National Science Foundation. I did a lot of work that took me to something like 80 countries. And Gene kind of didn't believe me. And I remember very, very clearly he said, have you ever been to Upper Volta? Uh, which is a country in West Africa that's now called Kino Faso. Uh, Kino Faso. Yes. And I said, yes, I have been in Upper Volta. And he says, oh, yeah? Then what's the capital? And I looked at him and I said, did you pull it? Wagadougou. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that was it. So, so an eye roll and Wagadougou, and it was love at first sight. 
And uh, I have sailed up Lake Volta in a banana boat. Really? Yeah. No, on really? There's a little tiny <laughs> bit of. <laughs> anyway, uh, he. I got a call the next day from Mazlish saying. Gene wants me to go to the studio to get you out of your contract to come and produce this new series. And I, I did, I, I had three strikes against me. A, it was a sequel. And at that point, we're in the mid eighties now. There right. were, there were no sequels being done on right. television. B, it was going to be syndicated and nothing was syndicated. People watch things on networks. Right. And, C, it was science fiction, and there was no science fiction no on science television. science fiction either. But I disliked the executive job to such a degree that I called Liz, my wife, and I told her about it. And the next day, uh, my salary tripled, and I was working across the street for, uh, for Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, about that, and I roll in Wagadoogie. <laughs> Still the day. Yeah. There's probably not another person alive who can say an eye roll and Wagadugu got them, got, got them their career going. Absolutely remarkable. Uh, did so you and Jean? I mean, did you have? Did, was there chemistry initially and immediately, or I mean, did that grow? No, there, we we the chemistry was sort of frightening. I mean, uh, Bob Justman and I, who were co-producers, uh, Bob was this remarkable. Th- fellow who died a number of years ago uh he uh what was it bob justman was what did he do he had been a he had been a producer producer on the original series and he had done a number of other television series the name rings a bell in the interim when it came to splitting up who was responsible for what right for reasons that i absolutely don't know gene gave me all the good stuff he gave me casting he gave me production he gave me writing uh, and he put Bob in charge of budgets and scheduling and things like that. <laughs> so you were building it from the ground up. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, uh, I, I found myself uh, getting closer and closer to Gene and Majel. All right. Going to their home uh, for dinner. Uh, they both fell in love with my wife. And uh, we, we were very close. And uh, I, uh, I've been to that home, by the way. Um, well, that was a, the, the, the house that I originally went to was in uh, the jungle room. Was it that it one? It was the, one up the, in the, the Beverly Hills. That or? was in that was in Bel Air. Bel Air. So, so did he take a, a, a back seat to what you were? Oh, not n- not at all. No. In se- season one, Gene ruled the roost, and he ruled it in a way that had nothing to do with the normal way television is done. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was no writer's room. There was a number of writers were hired. He would get stories. He would hand them to a writer to write. Then he'd send it to everybody to give notes on. He just, he did things in a totally unkosher way. Mm-hmm. And I remember when it came time. So I get a call from Brandon, who I knew, chairman of Paramount Pictures. He asked me to come to his office and he said, uh, I'd like to do another series to run concurrently with Next Generation because Next Generation was doing surprisingly well. And he was famous for saying things like, let's do Father Knows Best connected with uh, Godzilla. And that, you know, he was I got very big, big bucks on- for this, by the way. <laughs> So he said, let's do Next Generation combined with The Rifleman. Uh, Who was that? Now, The the Rifleman. Rifleman Chuck Chuck Collins. The Rifleman was about, the part about The Rifleman that turned him on was it was about a father and a son off in the frontier uh, going into new places. So I went back and told all this to Pillar. I told him that I wanted Pillar to develop it with me. And we came up with the idea of Benjamin Sisko and his son, and that's how uh, that's how Deep Space Deep Nine got formulated. Had you was always been writing as well as producing, or did that come later? I, I had I had done some writing. Certainly, I did a lot of non-fiction type writing on a lot of the documentaries that I worked mm-hmm. on. Right. Uh, but in terms of 
the next generation, mostly what I was doing was uh, making writers and producers crazy by by giving lots of notes. Lots of right. notes, right. right. Uh, and I was not... I was not really a writer, nor was I really in charge of uh, the writing staff. Although every story and every draft of every script uh, was yeah, something that desk. I came across my desk and something that I got involved with and I would meet with the writers or producers. By this time, about. had you gone back to look at the original series to sort of, you know, to know what the hell you were talking about? Or were you just, you know, centered on this cast, this story? Yeah, I, I, I looked at... I, I I think I watched. I remember going and watching uh, a star. I think it was the first Star Trek movie I ever watched. Uh, was the one about the whales, uh, which I right. think was Star Trek Four. And I watched it with Gene in a screening room at Paramount. I think that was the first Star Trek movie I ever watched. Oh. Um, and Gene and I stayed close, and Majel and I stayed close, right? right to the end and it was it was devastating i mean gene was he wasn't well he went to the doctors and he left the doctors and i i believe in in the elevator uh on the way down from his doctor's oh, office goodness. in beverly hills is when he passed away really yeah was it heart I, I don't even know what he passed away from was it did his heart give out in the end he had uh i mean gene had some habits that were not yeah. Typically great. He did a, he did a lot of drinking, and he was uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think he might have been diabetic, and he did a lot of things that he probably wasn't supposed to do. Mm. Uh, he was only I think seventy years old. Oh, wow! And uh, young, although he he certainly didn't uh, he didn't look look it. And I'll tell you something interesting. Um, there was a Star Trek convention in Los Angeles that Gene was supposed to be the main speaker of. And this was this would have been in ninety one, and they asked me to fill in, and I, I had never done a convention or anything <laughs> like that before, so I couldn't Terrifying. I couldn't say no, <laughs> so I filled in, and I did this, uh, convention, and the next Star Trek event where I sat and and uh, spoke, was uh, happening right now. Really? Is it, wow. the, this is the only other time you've really sat down at what you might call a, and that's incredible. That's awesome. So 30 years, <laughs> 30, 30 years later, I've done a couple of... Uh, I knew this was a coup. <laughs> I've done a couple of pieces in, um, in, in movies where I've been interviewed for pieces well, and for the History Channel and things like that. Right, right. But I've, I've never gone to a single convention. Uh, don't ask me why. I think that, you know, I did... From the beginning of Next Generation to the end of Enterprise, uh, somebody was foolish enough to sit down and calculate that uh, I produced 624 hours of Star Trek. That's incredible feat. That's a cannon. As, 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 as well as four... Uh, as well as four movies. four movies. Right. There was a period when, of time, wasn't there, when you... I mean, a great swath of time where you had two shows... And maybe one yeah. or two movies going at the same ne time. Next Generation and uh, Voyager butted up against one another. Right. But across them both was Deep Space Nine. Right. And then Enterprise at the end. So, so we ended up doing... So what stages at Paramount... We, we were on 8, 9 and 18. Where were the... What other stages did you use there on the lot when you had two shows running at the same time? Do you remember... Were they just oh, next door up the, up the yeah, road? Yeah, we just had, uh, we had a slew of... A slew of stages. A, and, and then there were, during that period of seven years where we were doing two shows, uh, we made two of our four feature films. And they were done on Paramount stages too, as well as locations. So I didn't get home to see my kids all that often. Yeah. God, I, I was told I, that um, pretty much the franchise kept, the studio alive some during some lean times, Paramount, that is. Right. Uh, you know, without Star Trek, Paramount would have... We were the jewel in the crown, weren't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's how you get the Cooper building, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> is it? <laughs> you were, that's where your offices were, weren't the, they? The, the Cooper the building. Yeah, they building. did. Yeah. That'll be Gary Cooper people. But I want to back up for a second. Um, 
Did you feel without an anchor or what was your sense when Gene died? And then, I mean, it was, right. it was left to you. Well, when Gene died, I had worked with him on a daily basis for a year and a half. Yeah. At least. And I, we worked together every day and I understood Star Trek. I understood what Star Trek was about in his mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I understood what the 24th century was in his hopes, or at least in his fictional world. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, and, and the fact that he slowly stepped back during the second season, uh, it was, it was, it was not difficult because we were, at that point, Pillar and I were pretty much running the show anyway. Right. Was there talk of passing the torch or it just sort of naturally evolved as he? No, people like to talk about passing. There was never, I never saw a torch. If there was a torch. <laughs> it was underneath my seat. <laughs> it was, it, 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 yes, it was, it was, it was heat, heating up my seat. And, uh, uh, must have been I very remember, shocking to lose him so abruptly, though. It was, and 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 when when Tartikoff came and uh, talked about the rifleman, and Michael and I developed the concept for what became Deep Space Nine, we went to Gene's house, and he was in pretty bad shape, and we sketched out what we wanted to do, and he. Uh, he had a very kind of neutral to positive attitude. He wasn't against it. He wasn't for it. He liked the idea of one show on at a time. I like the idea of one show on at a time. Uh, and but the studio was is, gagging for two shows at the same time. <laughs> well, now now they've got uh, th thirty seven Star Trek shows yeah. going on at the same Incredible, time. Isn't that? Uh, but to me, it was. The analogy that I used to make was if you were a carpenter and, and, and you built chairs, beautiful chairs, mm. and then somebody came to you and said, uh, no more, no more need to build chairs. We're going to set you up with a, uh, a chair company. All big, right. And you're going to make a lot of money and you're going to have 30 people working for you. That's great, except you're, you're not making chairs anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And my feeling was that uh, doing two at once was a little bit difficult. And then when Star Trek The Gen Next Generation ended, they said, we have these time slots and we need to fill it. And that's when they asked us to develop Voyager. And then so for another three or four years, we had two shows on the air. Right. Uh, and then in the middle of all of this, Sherry Lansing, who was running the motion picture division at Paramount, came and wanted uh, first what was Star Trek Generations and then Star Trek First Contact. Uh, and, uh, and then Star Trek Insurrection and then Star Trek Nemesis. So we were turning out movies at the same time. So it was a it was a it was a busy era. But what was very crucial to me. And I would like to think that it remained crucial to the pathetically last uh, premature ending of, uh, of Enterprise mm. was to keep Gene's vision alive. Gene had a vision that dealt with allegory. It dealt with uh, his ideal of uh, a much better future. And... Uh, to tell stories using metaphor and uh, to not turn the shows into what later would become mm. Marvel shows. Mm. Right. I'm saying uh, I know I know some of the Marvel guys and they're great guys, but they're t they're turning out huge giant action movies. Right. Uh, and I think to some degree uh, there were those and there are those today who use the Star Trek concept as a vehicle to create big action movies that don't deal with the vision of humanity and right. the betterment of humanity that Gene wanted Star Trek to be. So I felt kind of strongly about 
trying to keep all of the Star Trek that we did within the realm of what Roddenberry believed in. It was his baby. Right? I think you did, and I think you did a terrific job. Yeah, I, and I, I think I think that, and I know actually that uh, fans who have gone from either the beginning of the original series or at, at least Next Generation who've continued on to be fans of you know, what, what's happening now. I mean, they, they sense that, they feel that, they comment on um, the, the difference. Era. Yeah, yeah, we were, we were part of, we were the end of sort of the golden age of, of what Star Trek is. And that's not to say that what they're doing isn't good. It's not to say anything about that. It's just to say that's different. What, so that brings us kind of succinctly to what do you think was the, the why, why was our show the one that uh, was the demise of the franchise as we knew it then and that Star Trek as a franchise might actually be in jeopardy? What what happened? I mean, well, we, I we were think, a good show. <laughs> I think we were I think we were we were a wonderful show. Uh, and I think it had a great deal to do with politics. First of all, there was something that somebody came up with the expression uh, franchise fatigue, which I think has some validity to mm -hmm. it. It had been, at that point, 12, 13 years of, of Star Trek every week yeah. and many weeks, two, for seven years. Yeah, two shows. Two right. shows. Uh, so there was maybe some validity to that, but I think most of it was politics. Mm. Uh we had UPN, and then we had uh, the WB, and we had uh, what? What came after that? The CW, uh, CW, CW, and, CW yeah. sort of you know transposed and, us all, didn't it? And then CBS became the owner, the, driving, the runner right. of of what was Paramount Television, right? Right, and their network. Which was at that point was the CW. Well, so I mean, well, what was it at the end? For us, it was UPN. It, we were UPN. It became the CW. Yeah, it, was, it ended, I think, the year that after. That was when, when I mean, Mr. Moonves. This is how my understanding of it that you know Paramount. Uh, some of the Redstone's interests were CBS, Paramount, uh, some radio stuff, Nickelodeon, you, Nickelodeon. He brought Mr. Mumvis had brought CBS to be the preeminent, you know, network show uh, network in America. And and UPN was flailing, uh, and there the height of their programming was this big show, Star Trek, this loaf of sliced white bread, and they were for a moment there they were trying to become the African American network, and they still had this you know you know Goliath of a show, and they stuck us around everywhere, and I I seem to remember Dawn Ostroff was in charge, and then this is my telling of it, you started getting notes. About you know you had yeah, three I, hit shows I, for crying out loud and you started getting notes about your other your fourth hit show. I went for years. How goalie would that be? There were so many TV producers I knew from other shows who were so jealous because I never got notes. Yeah. We didn't really have the studio and the network were one and the same, and they trusted us, and we got very very few notes. If we went over budget, they trusted that we would find a way to bring the budget down so that by the end of a season it would be uh everything would be fine what happened was whether it was upn or cw i i really don't remember they started focusing more away from science fiction away from star trek and more into television for younger yeah. people and yeah. for uh i think a, a lot of television programs for young women yeah. mm. and girls. What the stations paid, the license fees were pretty low mm -hmm. so that they would get more stations to take on uh, Enterprise. And eventually uh, the show, because of that, uh, the show started not making a lot of money. Mm. And we and, were quite expensive, weren't we? And the network had changed hands and the network was going in a different direction. And I got a call one day, not from Les, who was a friend of mine, somebody I, 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 I had, oddly enough, I had been introduced to him by uh, Tartikoff years before. A uh, call came from a fellow named David Staff, who was president under Moonves. And 
and he said, uh, we're going to be wrapping it up this season. That was on our fourth and season. And that was, was our yeah. fourth season of a show that we were expecting to run seven like all the others. So here we were doing a show that I think very smartly, because of the three shows that preceded it, very smartly went back to the origins yes. of, right. of yeah, the Federation on that. Starfleet. Yeah. And then- here we were, and we, we had three more years in our minds to get... Excuse, excuse me, <laughs> sorry. What do you have to say sorry. about it? All right. All right. <laughs> uh, a point where we realized we have three more years to get the Federation All right. created. Right. And now we were being told we had eight weeks to get the Federation right. created. So uh, we had to do a lot of tricky writing. And uh, that's when the idea came. There's no way we can fit all those years in. So I believe it was my idea. I take full responsibility because it was hated by a whole bunch of people. So I won't blame it on Brannon, my partner. Uh, the idea was to go on to the holodeck and that would allow us to jump. When I say the holodeck, I'm talking about the next generation right. holodeck. Right. That allowed us to jump a hundred years ahead and allow, in our case, Jonathan Frakes' character and Marina Sirtis' character to go on the holodeck and see things that happened right. in that so period that of time. So that was the inspiration right. of that episode, because I know it's taken some flack along the years. Yeah. There, was no, there, was, yeah. n- there was no other way to show the Federation being founded That's and right. to show Benjamin Archer right. doing a grand speech uh, when we had four or five weeks to wrap it up and we were in the middle of a totally different wave of stories. So we came up with the idea of let's get the next generation 100 years later to look back and to see exactly what happened so that we could uh, so we could tell the story of the ending from the future as opposed to from with 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 four weeks of writing and shooting to to it's get good us. To hear Thank this. God we can explain this now. I, I tell you, I, I don't know really. I yeah. mean, it's really good I, to hear true. this. <laughs> that, that there was a real honesty in the writing that created that final episode, and it was and not some other you know derivation of some you know. Inst- and that that was the only reason. We, right. It was the only way we could get ourselves to a point where uh, the Starfleet, where the planet. The planet Earth and 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 its people could join uh, the United Federation of Planets when it hadn't even been conceived of in a right. sense. Did you right. pass this by? Not to get too controversial. Did you pass this idea of Brown Scott's ear before you delivered the script? Or because I remember when we had our ten-year reunion at CBS, I'd never heard it from his mouth, but he was kind of pissed, wasn't he, that this was his wrap-up of his four years on... Yeah, everybody was pissed. I mean, we had people saying, how can you bring next generation... How can you make the last episode a next generation episode? Right. That we were giving the finger to, to Enterprise. And in reality, it was the last thing in the world we wanted to do, but we had to find a way to get ourselves to that day that was we were planning three years worth of uh, right. of stories to to get to. Well, that's uh, I we, we were so desperately writing those last episodes at that point sure. that I don't remember who we spoke to about it. But a lot of people were real unhappy. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, they were. I mean, I, I have to say. I don't know, personally as an actor, I remember taking the phone call, I was walking out of the Hollywood Y when you said, are you sitting down? <laughs> well, how about, how about this guy here? We killed him. Yeah, well, I got a phone call. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, think, I think Brandon called me. He's like, have you read it? And I said, no, uh, let me call you back. And I read through it. And quite honestly, in the moment, I'm like, oh, it's, a lot of it's about me which I'm pretty happy about. And then and I said, are we really canceled? He said, yeah, we're done. I said, I love it then. 
As long yeah. as long as my yeah. debt, right. you don't carry on for three more years. Right. Uh, no, I'm in, in, in my experience, the way I explain this for me is that uh, as an actor, it was incredibly satisfying because I got to tell the arc of a story. I got to tell the, the life of this guy and um, being able to sort of, you know, put a button on the end of that. I've always felt with a good death scene, with a good death scene, felt, yeah. you know, quite grateful for. Right. And it was it was important for us to have some some pretty intense drama in yeah. our final episode. Right. And uh, you were low hanging fruit by then. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it, even though a lot of this was being seen and perceived by uh, by Riker and Troy a hundred years later on a holodeck, uh, yeah. it was uh, it, it, it was our it was our our one alternative. The other example I remember of of uh, a, a a necessary death was. In our last movie, Star Trek Nemesis, the character of Data was killed. His doppelganger right. uh, you left, was, was, was alive. You left the door. We, we left yeah. the door slightly <laughs> ajar. He's back. <laughs> <laughs> well, is Brent, is Brent also doing Picard as well? I know Brent, yes, but he's not playing Data. He's not. Ah, right. Right, right, right. And they are, they are done with that. Right. They well, done. as we all know, nobody really, really dies in science fiction. That's, uh, that's oh, you're dead, <laughs> <laughs> dead, dead, dead. Yeah, you're dead. I saw your, I saw your course. <laughs> yeah. you're, 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 you're finished. Uh. Hey, newsflash, newsflash, it's Dominic here. We've got some very exciting news to share with you. First of all, thank you so much for all your love and support for this show. Uh, we're super excited. And uh, a lot of you have been writing in uh, and letting us know that you want more. So with that in mind, we are going to launch our Patreon channel where you'll get access to uncut episodes, a lot of bonus content, maybe my arse and a whole lot more. So check out the link to Patreon below and we'll keep the entertainment coming. No, 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 no. I quit. <laughs> <laughs>